Welcome to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry, a clinician's guide to the latest psychiatric research. I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. Each episode, I interview a leading psychiatric researcher about how their work translates into clinical practice. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Michael Bogenschutz. Dr. Bogenschutz is a professor of psychiatry at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine and director of the Center for Psychedelic Medicine. In our conversation, we talked about his recent work on using psilocybin to treat alcohol addiction and dive into the details of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Well, hello, Dr. Bogenschutz, and thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's my pleasure. Well, I'm going to ask you a broad question first, and then we'll get into the specifics. But can you tell our listeners a little bit about the overview of your research? Well, so at the Center for Psychedelic Medicine, we're focused primarily on clinical research, and the overall goal is to develop new treatments for hard-to-treat psychiatric conditions such as addiction, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, taking advantage of the um, exciting um, effects that we've observed in um, early studies with psychedelic medications such as psilocybin, MDMA, and uh, a number of others that are also being studied currently. And how long have you been doing this research? Like, how long have you been somewhat allowed to do research with the, with these substances? As most people probably know, there was quite a bit of research done in the 1950s and 60s with psychedelic drugs, uh, primarily LSD, but some other um, compounds as well. And that came to a fairly abrupt halt around 1970 with the passage of the Controlled Substance Act and the social climate at the time. The psychedelics were strongly associated with the countercultural movement and the protest against the war in Vietnam. And there were a lot of things going on at the time that generated a lot of fear of psychedelic drugs and um, awareness of harmful effects, which they can have. But I think People got a rather exaggerated view of the dangers and sort of lost sight of the fact that these drugs really did have a lot of clinical potential, which was just beginning to be studied during the 1960s. And so there, you know, there had been active research on um, psychedelics to treat um, alcohol use disorder, for example, was a was studied a lot and um, promising studies and uh, also in treatment of anxiety and depression around the end of life, people with life-threatening illness, and um, really uh, a number of other conditions as well. So that really came to a halt and there was almost no clinical research on psychedelics from between early 1970s to the um, just before the turn of the 21st century. Um, And then Gradually, there started to be some work done, uh, primarily with with psilocybin this time around. And I got interested in the field after having seen one of the first studies that came out, a seminal study in uh, 2006 from uh, Johns Hopkins on uh, effects of psilocybin in healthy, normal volunteers. And it showed not only that the drug appeared to be uh, safe under controlled conditions, but also that the vast majority of people had experiences that they considered to be highly meaningful, highly significant, Hmm. and associated with significant benefit in terms of their overall outlook and well-being and in their relationships and in their functioning. So that was kind of an eye-opener to me that, A, that you could even give these drugs to people, and B, that they seemed to be well-tolerated and that most of the effects were positive. So I was somewhat aware of the work that had been done much earlier in in alcohol use disorder and thought that that would be an ideal condition to to study this time around with with psilocybin. So I started to work on some study protocols and uh, started our first study in 2012. Wow. And um, yeah, so have been studying psilocybin since then and more recently have gotten involved in the research on uh, MDMA for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and um, sort of expanding uh, into other potential indications for psilocybin. Well, it sounds like this this work does excite you, this research excites you. What What is so exciting about being able to look at the impact? Well, 
You know, the field of psychiatry, in terms of the medications that we have, I mean, there's been some steady progress, but really the major classes of medications that we use were all discovered, you know, over half a century ago. The, mm. the you know, the antidepressants, the antipsychotics, the mood stabilizers, and, and also in um, addiction, the sort of replacement type medications and blockers. And so we've refined the, the treatment. We've come up with medications that are, you know, potentially somewhat more effective that may uh, not have as many side effects, but there haven't really been huge breakthroughs in the in the terms of medications for the major classes of psychiatric conditions really since over half a century. So these drugs work in a very different way. And one of the amazing things is that we appear to be seeing effects that persist for weeks to months, potentially indefinitely, after administering a drug only once or two or three times to a person. So it's not, with most medications, you know, not only psychiatric medications, but for any other kind of chronic condition, normally a person will experience the benefit of the medication while they're taking the medication on a, you know, usually daily basis. And when they stop taking the medication, it's no longer going to be doing anything for them. And these treatments are really quite different. The medications in the body for only a few hours, but it triggers uh, change processes that continue and evolve over time and potentially result in improvements that are very enduring, if not permanent. Mm. So a shorter time needing the substance, but then a longer, longer term maintenance of gains? Yeah, and, the, 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 and that the gains persist after mm. the person stops taking the medication. So you're really changing the person and or mm-hmm. you know their brain and their behavior and you're not just affecting them through the time limited effects of the drug. Mhm. Yeah, that's really powerful and I know you know on the psychology side of things a lot of my patients a don't want to be on something forever but then get worried that when they do go off something that they've been on forever that all of their other symptoms are going to come back and you know with things like anxiety disorders we do see that. So this seems pretty groundbreaking to me and that it's you're you're saying you're seeing sustainable changes and even maybe functional changes for the long term. Yes, that's right. And, you know, another very interesting thing about these medications is that they, um, you know, psilocybin in particular seems to have beneficial effects across a fairly wide range of conditions. So we're talking about addictions, mood disorders, possibly anxiety disorders. And they seem to be acting on some abnormalities that, you know, we think of as transdiagnostic. In other words, mm-hmm. they're not, it's not that they're treating a disorder. They're treating some process or function within the brain that is out of balance and that uh, is associated with a number of different forms of uh, psychopathology or, or um, behavior issues. And do we understand like the mechanism of action of how they work or is that still somewhat opaque or is that like, do you, do you, do you have a sense of what's actually happening? Well, this is, it's a great question. And it's, you know, to me, this is really one of the most exciting questions because we really, we don't know that much. Mm-hmm. We know that the, so psilocybin, you know, for example, is uh, it binds primarily to the serotonin 2A receptor. That's true for all of the what we call classic psychedelics, which would include LSD, mescaline, DMT, which is the active ingredient in ayahuasca, which many people might have heard about. So they they all bind to the and activate the serotonin 2A receptor. That's probably responsible for most of the immediate effects in terms of altered consciousness and the experience that people have. And then there are downstream effects of that, which appear to cause a um, cascade of neuroplastic events. So you have remodeling of, you know, the brain cells, which form new attachments to other neurons, new pathways may be formed. And uh, so over time, you get subtle or maybe even not so subtle rewiring of the brain and new patterns of, um, of connection and of uh, communication among 
the neurons in the brain. Mm. So, yeah, but how that leads different, yeah, yeah. So it's very it's it's different, and how that you know how that works, and why you get a particular kind of change, and why you might get different kinds of results depending on what the underlying condition was the person had in the first place. You know, there's a lot that remains to be teased out, and mm-hmm. I think you know we we talk about sort of glibly about neuroplasticity, but I think it's important that people know, you know, being neuroplastic is just what our brains do, really. Our brains mm-hmm. are constantly changing. Every time we have a new memory, every time we, you know, have some kind of emotional experience, you know, it causes some changes in the brain. So it, there's nothing sort of magic or, you know, spectacular about that by itself, but it's the fact that somehow these these treatments are sort of reliably producing changes that are beneficial and in a positive direction, at least in the context of, you know, a therapeutic setting and mm-hmm. careful preparation and um, and monitoring and um, uh, combined with psych- psychotherapy to make the most of these experiences. So I think that's another important thing for people to know that when we talk about these treatments, we're really talking about not just the drug but the combination of the drug mm-hmm. with some kind of a psychotherapy platform that helps to channel this potential for neuroplasticity uh, and behavior change in a particular direction. I think, you know, we, we couldn't assume that if you just, you know, people just randomly took these drugs with no particular intention and with no particular preparation that you'd get anything like the same mm-hmm. kinds of benefits. Mm-hmm. And you would probably have a lot more in the way of potential harmful consequences as well. And what are some of these controls that are like, have you figured out like the right dose? You know, I, I think so much of this seems like opaque or, you know, how did you come to what's the right dose? What's the right environment? You know, just anecdotally, you hear about, you know, ayahuasca shamans. Like, is there someone who's with the person like as they're maybe experiencing some of these um, internal changes? So, so what like, what does it look like to actually be administered in this controlled way? There's really a lot of similarities in how the medication is used and, um, you know, most of the models that have been used, both for psilocybin and MDMA, really, there, there's a lot of commonalities. So, and and I think it's important to note that the uh, the beneficial effects that have been reported in these trials, they're all in the context of this kind of model. So mm-hmm. we we can't say anything about what might happen if we were doing things very differently. Right, right. So the first thing is that people who participate in these studies are, you know, initially they're carefully screened for any serious medical or psychiatric conditions that might make it dangerous for them to participate. Mm-hmm. And there aren't a lot of those, but people with, you know, out of control, uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, heart disease, uh, high risk for to have a stroke, all of those things might would increase the risk and, and would probably disqualify somebody from, from being in the study because the drug does raise blood pressure somewhat, just sort of to the same extent as, you know, maybe walking up a flight of stairs or something. But it's, it's not an extreme effect. But if you're not in good health, it could be, it could be risky. And similarly, if you had a history of uh, psychosis or a strong family history of psychosis, you might be at increased risk to have something like that triggered by a medication like psilocybin. So assuming the person is, uh, there's no medical or psychiatric reasons they shouldn't be in the study uh, and receive the medication, there will be some amount of preparatory psychotherapy. And most of the studies have used a team of two therapists uh, rather than just a single therapist to to support the person through the hmm. process. And so this is one of those things that some features of this model really were inherited from the way things were done back in the 1950s and 60s, and it's just the way it was done, and people thought it was good. So we don't know, you know, that you have to have two people in the room, but the idea is that support and a feeling of safety is is very important for people going through these intense experiences. And so uh, if you have two people who are, you know, grounded and not on the medication and providing support, you're just that much more likely to 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 feel supported. And if you had some kind of, you might feel more comfortable with one of the individuals than the other in a particular situation. And and um, 
and it's a little might be a little bit hard to predict what kind of support you might need. So it's an extra, just an extra measure of support. And the preparation consists of explaining to people sort of how the what what kind of effects they might experience, uh, how to manage those effects if they get to be pretty intense. You know, people on a high dose of psilocybin might feel overwhelmed. They might feel that they're sort of not in control of their thoughts or not in touch with their body in the same way as usual. And it's, it's a very highly altered state of consciousness, which can be disorienting and potentially frightening for people. So we want them to be prepared and have some ideas about kind of how to manage that and to feel comfortable enough with the, with the therapist that, you know, that they'll feel safe to be going through that. And the, the general uh, instruction that's given to patients going through these experiences is to be open and trust the experience mm. and to trust themselves to go through it and to be curious and invite whatever experience might come up rather than to try to control it or uh, mm. avoid it. And that, yeah, just accepting and, and learning from the experience rather than trying to direct it or uh, worry about it is, um, is the best way to get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, after, you know, two or three sessions with a pair of therapists in preparation, the patient will hopefully feel comfortable with those people, feel that they have some idea of what to expect in the session and how, how to deal with, you know, anything challenging that might come up. Then the, the actual sessions are... For both psilocybin and MDMA, they're about eight hours long. The drug effects uh, for both of those drugs last about four to six hours, and there's some, you know, startup and, and discussion afterwards. So it's pretty much a full day. Uh -huh. And during much of the session, the patient will be just lying on a couch. Often people will wear eye shades and listen to a program of music through headphones, and the idea is for them to focus on their internal experience rather than, say, you know, looking at objects in the room and, and noticing that they look different, or and rather than um, engaging in a lot of dialogue with the therapists. Now, that's a little bit different for psilocybin and MDMA on the, in the psilocybin treatment. With a high dose of psilocybin, people really uh, it, it's not terribly fruitful for people to have uh, to be trying to do therapy in that state, uh, you know, to be talking about things and, and trying to, you know, just even putting things into words can be very challenging. And so people with, in the high dose psilocybin sessions uh, will spend most of their time focusing inward and, and not interacting all that much with the therapist unless they just really want to say something or they're feeling uh, anxious or need to go to the bathroom or something like that. With the MDMA, people are in a more lucid state and they're, they're altered and they're in a, in a state of feeling generally open and trusting and safe in, in the context of whatever is coming up. And so in the case of PTSD, the advantage of the MDMA state is that it does provide this sense of safety and dampens any feelings of fear or threat that people experience. And particularly when dealing with memories of traumatic experience or, you know, any other kind of painful issue, one of the biggest barriers to therapeutic process is, is uh, avoidance and resistance. You know, we call it resistance if a person is not doing, you know, what we, what we think they ought to be doing, but they're not doing it because it's too painful or it's too frightening. And uh, so they're trying to take care of themselves, and it's a, you know, it's an appropriate defense. But uh, in this context, they are under the influence of the MDMA. They are able, many times, to look at things and to experience memories and the feelings around them without uh, being overwhelmed by by fear or just uh, overwhelming negative emotion and that allows people to to process and uh, reintegrate their memories in a in a you know quite profound way often quite quite rapidly more so than much more rapidly than they would in a ordinary 
uh, usual psychotherapeutic format. So with the MDMA, there often is a fair amount of conversation between the patient and the therapist and as they're kind of working through this material and, and verbalizing what's going on. And so they're kind of prompted to think about the traumatic memory. So, you know, when I do like prolonged exposure, we're asking people to go back and talk about what happened. And so is there some shaping around, we want you to talk about the traumatic memory, but you can now do it in a space where you're not, your fear is not so activated and heightened? Mm-hmm. We do bring that up, but it's, it's not, in the model that, that's been used so far, it's not exactly an exposure therapy in that it's, um, the goal was not necessarily to, to bring up that, that index trauma or any particular traumatic event and, and focus on that. If okay. it comes up, if it comes up, if it doesn't come up at all, uh, you know, the therapist would uh, invite the patient to think about that, bring, that, bring, bring up that memory and, and see what they might be able to learn about it at this point. So at this point, it's pretty broad. Like you really want someone to almost take you on the journey of what they're experiencing rather than curate it externally. One of the suggestions we, we give people is that they should, um, you know, trust their own sort of inner healing intelligence, if you will. And mm-hmm. um, there's some way in which they, you know, their body, their mind knows what they need to do. And if they just sort of allow that to happen, they're the best uh, person to figure out what that is and and to do that. And so that's, you know, similar to what I said earlier about you know, being open to the experience, it's, um, yeah, just inviting whatever needs to happen to happen. And that, it it does seem that in many cases, people at least feel that that is what is, what is happening and that there's in this sort of very special situation where they have, you know, the support of two therapists and they have this medication that's helping them to be open to their you know, their internal process in a way, much more than they usually are, that things things that need to come up, come up. Yeah. And it sounds like when they come up, it's a less traumatic experience or not that thinking about it's always traumatic, but it sounds like it's less heightened because of how they feel internally. Yeah. It's not, I mean, it's not as though it's a anesthetic kind of experience, Mm -hmm. but it, it just selectively dampens the sort of the, the fight or flight aspect of the response. So, you know, it might still be acutely painful to, to think about what happened or to, to, you know, to visualize this memory. But somehow there's, there's a part of the individual that's, that feels safe and is able to experience the, the reality that that is not what is happening right now. Mm. I mean, in PTSD, one of the core features is that it's just these memories and the, the feelings around them are experienced as an immediate threat, even though they are not. But it really feels like uh, it's existentially threatening even to go there. And and that makes it really hard to, mm-hmm. you know, to change your relationship to those memories if you can't even approach them. Right. And so being able to, it sounds like somehow this substance is able to create space for people to have a little bit of that distance to be able to do that work. Yeah, it's as though within them there's some, you know, kind of a safe harbor or just mm-hmm. a, yeah, they're in a place of safety with these memories that under other conditions would be, you know, overwhelming or threatening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And like you said, very different from what most psychiatrists would be uh, prescribing today. And I want to get a little bit into this um, really groundbreaking study that we published in August about um, psychedelic drug therapy helping alcohol addiction. So can you tell us a little bit about that study and maybe why it created such a buzz? Yeah. Well, it was the first um, randomized controlled trial of, uh, of psilocybin for a, an addiction mm. that had been published. And we had 95 randomized patients, 93 received medication. And that's, you know, may not sound like a really huge study, but in the context of psychedelic studies that have been done, mm-hmm. um, I mean, at the time it was the largest one. Now, there, you know, there's been one that's considerably larger and there will, there will be more, hopefully. But it was, it was a good-sized study. 
And what we found was that this model used two sessions of psilocybin, relatively high dose psilocybin, one month apart. And those sessions were in the context of a 12 week therapy or counseling program, which was standardized and included both some basic evidence based treatments for alcohol use disorder, including uh, motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral skills training. So there were some alcohol focused components to it and also the standard sort of preparation and support and um, integration or debriefing after the medication sessions to help people um, consolidate those memories and make meaning out of what had happened and decide, try to understand how they might be helpful to them going forward. So so it was, a you know, again, an integrated medication therapy treatment. And we had uh, psilocybin was the active drug. There was a active placebo, which was uh, diphenhydramine, which is the, you know, active ingredient in Benadryl. Mm-hmm. So it's an antihistamine. It's, it's a, you know, sedating and mind altering, but certainly not a psychedelic <laughs> drug. And then we followed these. These were people with uh, alcohol use disorder. They were drinking heavily at least four heavy drinking days in the month prior to their uh, starting the study. And that's um, and they met criteria for what you, for the the old diagnosis of alcohol dependence, mm-hmm. which um, which means they really were pretty severely addicted and impaired by their by their drinking and having major impact on their lives. And what we found was that. During the first four weeks when people were having the preparatory psychotherapy sessions, their drinking decreased by about 50% in both groups. Uh, the therapy was helpful. The Just getting ready to get the – to receive the medication in preparation for that, people were able to cut back by roughly 50%. And then after receiving the first dose of medication, the psilocybin group cut back they're drinking by another 50%. Wow. Roughly. So they were now drinking about 25% as much as they were initially. The uh, control group really stayed almost exactly the same. I mean, they they maintained the benefit that they had had from the first sessions of therapy, but they didn't gain any more. So uh, during the follow-up period, and we followed people for 32 weeks after that first medication session, Overall, the psilocybin-treated patients were having were, were drinking about half as much as the as the control group, and about a quarter of as much as they had been drinking initially. And if you looked at people, often want to know, well, you know, did people quit drinking? And some people did, some people just cut down. But if we looked at the the very last month of follow up, which was twenty eight to thirty two weeks after the re- receiving the first dose of medication. The during that month, forty eight percent of the psilocybin group, almost half, was completely abstinent, hmm. versus twenty four percent in the control group. So you know there were people there that also benefited, but it was you know twice as many, and fifty percent, close to fifty percent, is it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. So these were clinically very meaningful effects, and again they persisted for months. In this case, six months after um, they first received the medication. And you said this was only two doses of psilocybin? That's right. Wow. So it wasn't that they were, you know, leaving treatment and then using psilocybin regularly on their own. It was just for the trial, but it had an impact on their drinking behavior outside of the trial and then ongoing? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and I'm not aware of anyone that went and used psilocybin outside of the... Mm -hmm outside of the trial. So that there did not seem to be any desire on the part of people to to keep keep using. I mean, there were people who thought, you know, it might a, a booster session might be helpful maybe at some point. We did I, I didn't mention this before, but after they finished that follow-up the 32 weeks um, of follow-up, they um, we offered both groups a third session in which everybody received active psilocybin. So the control group got a single dose of, of psilocybin at that point, too, if they were still in the study. Mm-hmm. 
And most people did choose to take advantage of that. You know, we were talking about the mechanism and some are not fully understood, but it seems like with PTSD and MDMA, again, maybe creating that safe harbor internally, which made it safe to look at the past or feeling less regulated emotionally um, to be able to see those things. What is happening with um, alcohol use disorder and psilocybin? Like what what's what's going on there, do you believe? Well, it's this is again, it's this is probably my favorite question. If you ask people, you know, about their experience and how they think it worked, you know, the prevailing theory going into this was that there's something about the, you know, what people have called the the mystical type experience or the ego disillusion or ego death experience. So it's the experience of, you know, ceasing to be a separate person and, and sort of merging into the cosmos or, or whatever you want to call it. And the idea was that was really what needed to happen and what helped people to, what made the difference for people. In this study, we, you know, we're still trying to unpack this, but we didn't find any particular association with that kind of experience Hmm. in particular. If you asked people about, you know, what happened and why do you think this worked, um, we did a qualitative study on this and some people had those types of experience and they, you know, felt that they were one with the universe and that gave them a new perspective. Other people felt that they experienced self-love or self-compassion or mm. forgiveness in a way that profoundly changed how they felt about themselves. Some people had very difficult, painful, cathartic type experiences, you know, revisiting painful episodes in their past, perhaps things that they had done because of their drinking and how they might have hurt other people. Uh, There was one person who just felt physically that he was being put through the ringer and said it was, you know, literally the most painful experience of his life Hmm. and, you know, declined to have a second session, but was, you know, did not have another drink Hmm. for as long as we ever had contact with him, which was a couple of years. So those experiences were all over the map. But... You know, we really haven't designed studies that are adequate to try to unpack what's what's happening. I mean, we have we know that uh, from our questionnaires that we gave people that there was a significant decrease in craving for alcohol that persisted. There were improvement in mood or decreases in negative emotion states, I think is maybe a, a more mm-hmm. accurate thing to do, but increases in positive emotional states as well. So there was this sort of just change to, to a more positive experience in terms of emotion. And there were also evidence that people felt that they had better executive control in terms of feeling less impulsive, being mm. more planful and deliberate, perhaps being more mindful. So those features map pretty well onto what we think of as you know, the core areas of psychopathology in addiction, which are intense craving or desire to, uh, to use the drug, the um, um, kind of persistent negative mood states that people get into uh, when they're not taking the drug. They, you know, the drug makes them feel better temporarily. I mean, I say drug, I mean, you know, alcohol or drug. It's, it's, we think of the process as pretty similar between alcohol and most drugs of abuse, but people... Um, yeah, if, if, if they're used to taking the drug and they don't take it, they will tend to be in a, an irritable or dysphoric state because they're, you know, the drug has kind of altered their kind of their baseline. And then they have problems with uh, executive function and, and uh, control of their, of their behavior and their thoughts. That is one of the things that makes it harder for them to figure out how to not to drink, for example. So... So we have some preliminary evidence in alcohol use disorder just based on these questionnaires that, you know, people are having less craving, less negative mood, and better executive function after these treatments. Mm-hmm. But we, wow. we haven't done an objective study. So that's one of the things we're planning to try to do in the very near future. Yeah. And w- one thing that stands out to me is it's interesting, and I don't know if you know like the spread or the percentages, but it seems like some people have 
a really positive experience. Some people have maybe a more neutral experience. And then some people have a difficult experience, but it all led to the same outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is one of the very interesting things. And that's not to say that the experience isn't important, Mm -hmm. but it's just that there's not a particular kind of experience. And, you know, one thing about all of those experiences, for the most part, is that, you know, they're intense, they're memorable, and they're they're meaningful. They're interpreted mm-hmm. as meaningful. So that's that's another key feature of these experiences is that people can they're held as as um, as highly meaningful, and the and the memories are are very vivid, and so they have a they you know they appear to have a lasting impact. That's really like you said. It's almost like. Um, maybe it meets the person where they're at or what they need. It, it, it's really interesting uh, because, you know, if you if someone takes a benzodiazepine, you would assume they would have a lot of the similar a similar mm-hmm. experience, which is interesting that this might have a different – it might show up differently in people. But like you said, it might be important for people to have a variety of experiences. Well, and even in the same person in these studies where we have two or three sessions – the, the the flavor of those experiences may be mm. very very different yeah, with psilocybin. The, you know, the first one might be, uh, you know, very challenging and and difficult and dark, and the second one is, you know, joyful and expansive and and um, so forth. So or the other way around. So it's yeah, there certainly is a lot of variability. Yeah, which is fascinating for sure. And so if I I know that this whole topic is interesting to clinicians purely probably from just even an interesting understanding of what's happening. But what do you see for the future of this research? And when do you see that psychiatrists could implement this on their own? Or should they be thinking about maybe referring their patients to academic research centers that are having studies? Like what what is there for a psychiatrist listening to this today? What should they do with this information at this point? Mm -hmm. Well, We'd love to have people, you know, clinicians refer people to our studies, of course, mm-hmm. but the, the um, you know, these are relatively small studies. And so they're, they're just, you know, not, there's not the ability for very many people to get these treatments at, at this point. But MDMA, the, the second of the two pivotal trials of MDMA for PTSD has been finished and will be published in the near future and presented to the FDA within the year. And so there's a good chance that MDMA could be approved as a treatment as early as next year. Wow. So that's that that could be here really pretty soon. Psilocybin is not as far along. The first phase three studies are just beginning. So that will be, you know, probably a couple of years behind at least, but still on the horizon. So I think, you know, in the meantime... There are a lot of, you know, people read about these these studies and hear about the impressive results. And there's there's been a strong push to try to make these drugs more widely available through these state initiatives and, you know, or other efforts to broaden access. And, you know, it's really understandable. We're we're excited too, but we have an FDA process and it's really to ensure that treatments are effective and safe. And, you know, and if the drugs either of these drugs is approved, it will be safe and effective in the context and the kind of treatment that it was, you know, that the studies were conducted. So Uh I think, you know, on the one hand, we want to get these drugs, you know, if they, if they are found to be safe and effective to uh, have as many people as possible be treated as soon as possible. And that will be the next big, you know, area for research and thinking is how do we, how do we, make these uh, treatments available, how do we, you know, at at a large scale and to do it as efficiently as possible so that people can afford it uh, without sacrificing the the safety or the efficacy. So, I mean, I think in the meantime, you know, we should should try to be somewhat patient and not try to cut too many corners, uh, which could jeopardize the whole whole, um, enterprise. But you know, to be to be ready and to be learning about what the treatment models are, how this might work, and to be able to counsel our patients uh, who might be 
in a position to benefit from these treatments when they do become available. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it seems like from from what I've seen that there was there's been some research with cannabis and then moving into, like you said, MDMA, psilocybin. What do you see even with the future? Do you see, I don't know if there already are, but like ayahuasca trials or other um, things that, again, have been more culturally complicated that we'll see used in clinical research? Yeah, well, there are there are hundreds of, if not thousands, of psychedelics that are already characterized. Very, very few of them have been in, um, you know, been given to to humans. And so, you know, with the exception of the the ones that are well known, such as, you know, LSD and mescaline and and, and psilocybin and uh, DMT, they're they're not nearly as far along. But there is, you know, there's a lot of interest from pharma now in developing new chemical entities that. You know, one one kind of interest is, you know, are there drugs that are not psychoactive in the same way that would be easier to use potentially, but that have a lot of the same benefits, you know, or not? It, you know, if the if the experience uh, that's intense and meaningful is a big part of how these drugs work, then there might be some limitations to that. But there may be effects that that are completely independent of that. Mm. You know, if we're talking about just neuroplasticity per se, that there might be ways of causing some of the same effects to happen that could still be used together with some kind of behavior change therapy uh, and and could have good efficacy. So, you know, shorter acting drugs. So, you know, these all day sessions are labor intensive and relatively expensive. If the same kind of benefits could be achieved in a brief, you know, 15 or 30 minute intravenous infusion or or just or um, something that's um, you know insufflated through the through the nose that would be that would be great we don't know if that's possible and again there may be something about you know an experience that unfolds over time and also you know the amount of time that the drugs are in the brain and can actually do their thing might might be important so you know there's a lot of interest in finding ways to get the same benefits you know, in less time with less challenge in terms of managing these intense experiences. Um, but we don't know to what extent that can be separated. Mm-hmm. So time will tell. And um, there's just an awful lot of, uh, a lot of different directions that this research needs to go all at once. So we're hoping there will be um, an increased interest in, in funding this kind of research uh, so we can get moving. It seems like it's, yeah, it's really trending very positively initially, um, which will likely probably give it the legs to, to, like you said, get into more specifics and and different ways of dosing, et cetera. Um, and my final question for you, in the beginning, you were talking about the Johns Hopkins study that looked at healthy controls. And it sounds like your research has been focused on people who are really struggling with acute challenges. Mm-hmm. W- what are your thoughts in the future for maybe, I don't know, like the worried well, or people who don't necessarily meet criteria for a clinical level disorder, is there, is there some kind of belief that psilocybin could help even just the everyday person? Well, that's, I mean, again, it's a really good question. And, you know, on the one hand, you know, in, in medicine, we tend to focus on, you know, treating disorders and, you know, fixing what is broken. But, uh, you know, there's legitimate criticism for that and a, and a more sort of uh, positive, you know, preventive and, and wellness approach or, you know, sort of positive psychology approach is, I mean, it's reasonable. If, if we're going to talk about it as part of treatment, we, we still need to be able to, be, to demonstrate some kind of a, a benefit. So I think there are certainly people who, you know, believe they have benefited in ways that didn't have to do with treatment of any major illness, you know, before we want to endorse something like that, we would really need to show that, you know, overall there's, you know, that there'd be more benefit than harm and that it's something that, um, you know, is actually worth supporting rather than mm-hmm. something that's, you know, unproven and, and but it, because there are real risks to these treatments. And if somebody is, you know, actually doing very, very well, then you know, the risk benefit might be very different for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And and just quickly with the risk benefit, some of the risks that you have seen, it it sounded to me like when you were talking earlier, maybe more of an emotional risk if it wasn't monitored well or, you know, it were maybe taking too much or too little. Are there other risks that you observed? Well, the the main risks are the sort of the acute psychological risks due to, um, you know, overwhelming experience or, you know, if somebody is not in a controlled environment and they become disoriented and they, you know, walk in traffic or something. So there's that. But there's also more subtly, I mean, these experiences do change people. Uh And so for people who, you know, want to change, need to change, Uh have some particular thing they need to to work on, that's a good thing. But, you know, it's 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 never going to be completely predictable how how um, how a person might be changed by one of these experiences. So I think change can be good. Change is inevitable, but it, change is not always desired or or beneficial. So I think, you know, that's just part of the, the calculus when you're talking about people who don't particularly need to change. They may want to change in some particular way. And then that's, that's, that's a somewhat different question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then we're getting all philosophical. So, um, but this has been such a fascinating discussion. And, and you know, my, my last point here, um, so for clinicians, obviously keep your eyes on the research. There could be some promising developments in the next year or so, even with MDMA, maybe in the next few years with psilocybin. Um, and then are there, you know, NYU is actively recruiting for participants and any any other academic medical centers you would recommend if, you know, psychiatrists want to refer their patients? Well, they're, um, you know, they're popping up like mushrooms. So <laughs> I think um, just uh, the best place to look if for somebody who's interested in being in a trial, I think, is on the clinicaltrials.gov mm-hmm. website that has all of the active trials and some that haven't started yet. And, um, you know, often it will list the sites where they are being conducted. And so that that's a comprehensive list um, wh- where people can look. But if you, you know, if you want to, if you're interested in participating in one of our studies, uh, you can go on our, our website, uh, Center for Psychedelic Medicine. And there's an interest survey that, you know, where you can leave your contact information, and say what kind of study you might be interested in. And when, when we're recruiting, we'll... Uh, will uh, look you up. Wonderful. Well, that's great news. And uh, I feel like it's exciting news as we look toward the future of personalized medicine and treating people who may have otherwise uh, suffered and stayed in a state of suffering. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And thank you for being with us on the podcast. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much again for that conversation, Dr. Bogenschutz. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry on your podcast app. For the Department of Psychiatry at NYU Langone, I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. See you next time.